this is Emeritus Professor Patrick De Decker from ANU's Earth Science Department and I'm Professor Caitlin Burt from ANU's Research School of Biology. And we're in Captain's Flat, which is about 60 kilometres south east of Canberra. And we're having a look at the uh, historic mine site here, which is currently undergoing remediation. The New South Wales government set aside around $33 million to remediate this site. Um, and Patrick's telling us some of the history of this site, of how the deposit formed, what happened here, what happened in the context of the collapse of the tailing dams and the implications of that for some of the waterways feeding all the way through into Canberra. This is the Captain's Flat uh, uh, mine. It's actually called Lake George Mine. And uh, it, they extracted uh, copper, zinc, lead and some silver and a bit of gold here in the, the late 1800s. The original site looked at by Reverend Clark, a cleric who was also a geologist and trained in England, and he in fact found gold here, but did, did, he did not disclose this for quite some time. Eventually when uh, uh, the, the, this was publicized, there was actually a gold rush here but eventually they extracted uh, these important uh, metals uh, which were bound with uh, as, as sulphides. So uh, the important aspect is that they had to smelt uh, the, the ore and there were some fumes that uh, went around the landscape and uh, uh, had a detrimental effect on the environment because of the toxicity of these uh, metals, but also the, the sulphides. A little bit about the, the ore minerals, they're all bound to sulphur. And uh, when this is in uh, an anoxic environment, so buried in, uh, in the ground, and it won't change at all. But as soon as the these uh, all mineral leads, uh, sulfur and copper sulfur, um, become in contact with water with oxygen, it oxidizes and the uh, byproduct is sulfuric acid. And we know very well this is a very uh, 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 dangerous solution. As they were smelting, the ore in the, the late uh, 1800, and then they reopened the mine later on during the Second World War. The fumes from the smelter went around the landscape and actually uh, killed quite a lot of the vegetation. I understand that some of the trees are, uh, stunt, have stunted growth as a result of uh, uh, these toxic uh, uh, fumes. Kathleen can tell you more about what she's going to do with uh, uh, the vegetation and what she's going to try to assess. Yeah, absolutely. So we're super interested in vegetation that has hyperaccumulated metals, so definitely copper, but any sort of critical metals to understand what sort of biological mechanisms those organisms use to identify at a molecular level uh, which metal it is and actually manage to uh, partition that to different parts. So say, for example, you know, some of the trees here probably would have elevated gold, right? Because the eucalyptus leaves love uh, hyperaccumulated in gold um, and it'll be interesting to explore which of the vegetation might possibly hyperaccumulate copper as well um, and have a look at whether that has actually impacted the growth of the vegetation. So we're in Captain's Flat which would be about 60 kilometres southeast whereas and, and that connects, connects on a fault line is that right all the That's way right. through to uh, Lake George which would then be north east. Yeah there are many fault lines in the area which run north-south. It's a very old feature of the landscape. This was, uh, all the sediment here were deep sea sediment. Very, very deep because there's no carbonate in these uh, sediment and very few fossils as well. There's another mine near here, Woodlawn, that uh, they extracted um, uh, 
the same metals uh, as uh, Captain's Flat uh, starting in the uh, 70s and uh, the mine closed uh, a few deca decades later. You can see behind us uh, the effect of the mining and the lack of vegetation because uh, you may have odd crops there but you expect some grasses to grow and there's none at all. So a real indication of the toxicity uh, of uh, the fumes and uh, the residues that ended up on the landscape. Later on during the day we might go to um, the creek here, Malonglo uh, Creek or Malonglo River that eventually joins Canberra uh, and Lake Burley Griffin but there was a lot of waste, we call them uh, tailings, we'll uh, have a look at them uh, a bit later on. And in the mid 60s the tailings uh, collapsed, there was a landslide and a lot of the uh, wastes from the tailings ended up in Malongo Creek and um, some of these toxic metals were eventually flew to Lake Burley Griffin. There was a very high level of cadmium and copper and zinc, these toxic metals. People now say do not disturb the sediment on the floor of Lake Burley Griffin because this, the uh, contaminated material is now covered with additional clays and so on. So let's leave it there. Tailings were uh, maintained and uh, uh, refilled and changed uh, with funds from the federal government because they realized uh, how significant this environmental impact was in, in the landscape. So we are on the very edge of the town, which you can see behind me, Captain's Flat. That was a very vibrant uh, town of miners. We probably had some uh, medical issues because of the uh, material they were handling and breathing, because they, were, they had smelters uh, as well. And this water is quite aggressive. So it would uh, go down towards the town and uh, which is quite inhabited still but very poor soil, low quality soil because of the, the chemistry of the, the soil. I would not grow vegetables in this town. That's my personal opinion and uh, but it's uh, uh, quite important. So you can see behind me the horse rock, the local rocks which is a uh, fine grain shale, uh, just a mudstone that was accumulating, deposited on the sea floor. There were these vents um, spewing some very hot liquid uh, into, into the surrounding uh, ocean. And here's some of the rocks and you can see the Parat has a typical uh, cubic shape. It's often called fool's gold because it looks like gold but it's iron sulfide and here you have uh, some uh, uh, places where the, the pyrite crystals would have been. They've been dissolved away by these oxygenated uh, waters and that would have produced um, sulfuric, sulfuric acid that are uh, was mentioning. The creek down there, I'm quite sure, has a very low pH. We've been here with June in the past and uh, we had a pH of about two. If I was to break this rock with a hammer, I probably would still find the fool's gold, the pyrite uh, crystal. And uh, in this other uh, one, uh, I think I can also see some uh, places where you had some of these little mm. um, uh, crystals. Okay, very much evidence of uh, no oxygen on the seafloor uh, or above the seafloor in those places because of these uh, vents. 
there. So they wanted the they wanted copper, they wanted gold, they didn't want the lead and cadmium, but that was just happened to be here. Oh uh, no, they were still using that uh, for uh, lead was quite pure oh, uh, so and lead cover on roofs and so on. So lead uh, was a very important uh, mineral still. Okay. But they didn't want the cadmium. Oh, the cadmium, no, it's toxic. Yeah. And, uh, okay. so but it was part of that. Uh, so they wanted the copper, gold, lead. They didn't want the, the cadmium, zinc, but we ended up zinc. with And the yeah. zinc. And there was silver as well. And silver. Yep. And then uh, silver was quite... Uh, uh, quite rich here. So the challenge for the future is where there's area that you might potentially come in and do copper mining from the start, the goal would be to be able to access the resources which we need for the clean energy transition but without creating the impacts on the environment and the communities yeah. that have happened historically. The key challenge is for us to be able to electrify everything, we do need a lot of copper resources. And so in some cases, mines are being reopened. So Woodlawn was closed for a long time and now it's being reopened to be able to access more copper. Being able to come up with strategies that mean that we can access critical resources without creating the same sort of environmental problems is really important. And we also want to address the challenge that at any given mine, when you come in um, and you harvest copper, Often you're not actually uh, getting as much as you potentially could from that. You might be getting 40% of what's available and you might be leaving 60% behind in various forms of waste. So one of our other challenges is to be really efficient and think about how would you actually harvest those resources from the waste sources. To be able to see if we can do test runs, whether we can actually get our technology to harvest things like copper out of like the dirty tailings waste. <laughs> that would be extraordinary. This is uh, the Malonglo River that uh, goes all the way to Canberra and, uh, and feeds into uh, Lake Burley Griffin. And it is the creek that was the carrier of all the toxic metals from the tailings when uh, you had a, a landslide. And so it was quite uh, a very toxic creek for a while. So we are on the very edge, very close to the, uh, the, the mine, the entrance of the mine, but sadly it's now closed to uh, to the public. There was a view, viewing platform a little bit further up, but that's also closed. Uh, I think it's being uh, renovated, I assume, but uh, when we came with students, we always had access to this and we could actually walk to the, 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 the metal door, the entrance of what was called a Lake George uh, mine. I, I don't, a, a strange name, but I suppose it's associated with a the lake nearby. So there's the mine site entrance. Does that mean that underneath the area through there, there would be a series of tunnels? Oh, definitely. And there were, in the tunnels, they used a lot of wood as pylons from the vegetation they would have cleared in the landscape here. So there were a, a double effect on the, the changes of the, the landscape. So for mine tailing ca categories, there would be the actual rock and you know waste rock and then there's tailings ponds so the liquid waste so the big mounds over there would be uh, the leftover rock that's just been heaped yeah, up. Yeah rock and pulverized rocks and uh, sediment and it looks as if they pinted uh, conifers on top to maintain to give it some stability but uh, the remediation has actually created some levels, again, to prevent another uh, devastating landslide. The particular sort of tailings that we're interested in is the liquid tailings, so tailing ponds. And some people have told us that there might be 
you know, a tailing pond that has like $2 million worth of value, but it's got $4 million worth of headaches because of the things that you don't want in it and because of the toxicity and how would you manage it and clean it up. So what we're interested in is how can we innovate to be able to build systems such that you can achieve the value gain while simultaneously cleaning up that toxic pond. I think that for our purposes, being, under, being able to understand uh, what's in the liquids that are in and around the areas here and can the technology that we're building extract critical resources from those liquids, that would help us to understand what might be the implications of what we're building globally. It's a nice local site that uh, has examples of mine tailing liquid wastes that we might be able to process.